Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Plant Powered People Podcast with your hosts, Michelle Kane and Tony Okamoto. I am really excited about our guest. He is a great friend of ours. He actually officiated our wedding and did such a fantastic job. Even my friends and family who are not really interested in mindfulness and veganism and all the things that Paul and I care about personally, they were so enthusiastic about it when the wedding was over. So anyway, his name is Ari Nessel. He is such a wealth of knowledge in the space of meditation and mindfulness. And that is why we have brought him on the show. In one of our episodes with Bruce Friedrich, you may have heard him mention Ari and how it has been a helpful resource in combating antagonistic comments from family regarding veganism. And it just sparked an idea that he might be a great fit for our podcast. Yeah, especially as two people who really advocate being friendly, upbeat, happy vegans, <laughs> happy plant-powered people. It is really, really helpful to use every tool out there available to us to get us in a mental state that's able to respond the way that we want to in positive, productive ways, have upbeat conversations and not really get dragged down by all of the weights that we carry around with us from what's happening in today's world. So Ari is also the founder of the Pollination Project. He hosts and leads meditation workshops and retreats. He is a volunteer, always working to spread small acts of kindness. And he invests in incredible projects and helps bring so much to the world. And so today we're excited to dig in to mindfulness and meditation with Ari. Hi, Ari. Thanks for joining us. So grateful to be on this phone call with you, Tony and Michelle. Where are you calling from today? I am calling from my office here in Marin County, Northern California. So beautiful. Ari lives in a place that is not too far from the ocean. And so he goes on hikes and I have even been with him there. It's such a gorgeous area. It's maybe the best area in California, in my opinion. Well, whenever you want to come back for a hike or Michelle, you want to bring, <laughs> come with your family, Please, uh, please join us. We'll all go together. Oh my gosh. We'll definitely take you up on that. <laughs> Nature plus mindfulness is the best. So we want to talk today about mindfulness, but before we get into that, can you explain a little bit about your upbringing and how your journey all started? Yeah. And I'll try to just bring, uh, I don't think you want to hear my entire upbringing and how it all started, but maybe I'll give you some of the relevant parts to this to this podcast. No, Ari, we want to know where your parents were when yeah. they conceived you and then on. <laughs> Just All joking. right, where that's relevant, I'll, I'll go, you, you pull me back to it. So where my, my plant-based journey started was actually the same places where my journey of mindfulness began. When I was uh, 13, I, I grew up in Michigan and I was visiting family in Southern California. While we were visiting, we were walking down this place called the Venice Boardwalk, which is a really well-known place. And for all the eclectic things that go on there, people like walking on broken glass and fire and juggling and hawking various materials. And one of those interesting vendors or people that were there was this gentleman who had all this information up. And this is 1986, keep in mind, who was showing pictures and visuals and had inf and written information about how animals are raised for food, specifically how they're confined, uh, mutilated and slaughtered. And, you know, be both being 13 and in the 80s, this was not common information. I read it pretty in depth at this, you know, sort of makeshift poster boards he had up. And at some point my parents said, hey, all right, it's time to get going. And I said, thank you. And I kept walking on, seemingly unchanged. 10 years later, I moved to Southern California in my early 20s, and I'm living there. And I walk, I go to this Venice Beach to walk down that area, not remembering what happened a decade earlier. And as I'm walking, I see the same guy with a similar booth about 100 feet ahead of me. I don't, uh, I don't actually walk up to the booth, but somehow, in some way, in my 10-year gestation period of reflection, I finally get it. And I connect the dots between my food choices and the consequences of the way I was eating and who I was eating. And it just a light bulb goes off in my head. 
I don't walk up to the guy. I don't walk up and read what he has to be, has to say. And in that moment, I decide I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change what I eat. And I cut uh, land animals out of my diet at that time, because that's what I had read about. And which I had an understanding of where there was inconsistency between my values and my choices. But more important, more importantly, or as importantly, when I had that insight, it was the second part of the insight was, wow, I can't believe it took me 10 years to see this. And now that I see it, what else was I not seeing? What else was right in front of me that should have been so obvious about my choices and its consequences that somehow I was blinded by through culture, through my ancestry, through what was not wanting to touch what was uncomfortable. And so it led to a a broader uh, inquiry. I could call more of a spiritual inquiry about where else was I was I out of alignment with my values and what other unexamined assumptions was I making in life? And so that broader question led me to uh, mindfulness and meditation because I saw how difficult it was to see what you couldn't see and what wasn't seen by those around you. And so I was asking, what would be an intervention? What would be a practice that would allow me to see that part of my life that I was, I was blinded to, that were, where there were shadows? And my definition, if you have a shadow, you can't see it normally you know, on your own. You need help from others. Or you need new eyes with which to see them. For those who don't know what mindfulness, can you explain what that means? Yeah. So mindfulness is a, it's a, it's a catch-all term. And, it, and I, what I'm going to say doesn't, isn't necessarily the definition of it. I think a common way to uh, describe what mindfulness is knowing and knowing that you know. And so that is, means like, so if you're, you're walking and you know you're walking, you think that's like, so wow, that's really easy to do. It's obvious. But most of the time when we're walking, we don't even know, we're, we don't even recognize we're walking. We're not present to our feet lifting and retouching the ground and the sensations on our feet around us. We're walking and we're present to who's on the phone call with us, to thoughts in our mind, to what we're, where we're walking towards. But we're not actually present to the present. And so mindfulness is, be, is bringing a present moment awareness into life and a, uh, in a way that is intentional. And so what happened is, as I started um, moving down this path of mindfulness and which can be practiced in an in, in the informal way, like I just said, like walking, or even in conversation, just being really aware of my body and the physical sensations of my experience in speaking with you or my emotional experience. There's also formal practice, which might be like, you know, meditation. Often is like sitting meditation. Sometimes you can do formal walking meditation. There's just chanting. There's, you know, one could say prayer is a formal form of meditation as well. Many kinds and ways to practice. But as I started practicing it, I became, I was able to uh, uh, be more judicious or more intentional about how, how I received the world around me and how I responded to the world around me. And it sort of transformed what I thought happiness was into a way that became much more reliable. But it made it so that the happiness I used to, I used to seek, which was getting what I want and not getting what I didn't want which was an inherently unreliable way for happiness transformed. It became to how can I be happy despite whatever is arising? How can I bring uh, to my present moment, whatever it might be, can I receive that in a way that is non-judgmental and doesn't need to be otherwise than it is. And in sort of in that deep acceptance of the moment and being with it fully, I've learned that like, Happiness is not an ex- not is less based on circumstance. It's more based on attitude and how I receive the world, as I was saying. That's really interesting. Actually, the reason we thought of you as podcast guests is because we were chatting with Bruce Friedrich about how to converse with people who may be antagonistic about your choices surrounding food. And people who may be listening to this are wondering, how does mindfulness and plant-based food go together. And so can you tell me a little bit about your experience being both plant-based and mindful? And then later on, I would like to dig deeper into how we can use mindfulness as vegan advocates. And I know that you have so much experience in that space. So first, can we talk about mindfulness and vegan eating? Sure. And there's a lot of ways that overlaps, and especially what you just talked about with Bruce around sort of non-reactivity. 
You know, I think it's really easy when we come to have this insight about our food choices that it becomes not just a practice that uh, for our lives and how we live, but it becomes an identity. And really, I think for most of these most people, it's being plant based is something about it. It has an ingredients of about supporting one's health, their vitality, about living more compassionately and kindly, or to be living more sustainably on the planet. Generally, those are the three main reasons people make this choice. So you can call that moral, well-being, so and interdependent with life in some way. And so from each of those lenses, I think mindfulness is a really supportive practice. So mindful, it's very difficult to, you know, to swim against the stream. You know, our culture it does not incline plant-based eating, right? Would you guys agree with that? Yes, definitely. <laughs> in many ways to make it a stream. So mindfulness is a practice of, uh, is allowed, allows us not to fall into habit patterns. It allows us to be more choiceful because we're present to what we're doing right now, not to what we did yesterday or the way we were raised or way the people, what people around us are doing. It allows us to bring more intentionality to how we're living. And so when we start seeing ourselves reaching for that thing we would otherwise not want to re- reach for or order, then mindfulness helps us bring this back to the present and to our attention or to our, uh, into this new approach of living. So I think it's helpful that way. I think mindfulness also overlaps in the way of supporting well-being. So a lot of people choose mindfulness, I mean, uh, plant-based eating, as a way of supporting health and vitality. So there's been plenty of research to show that mindfulness is one of the greatest antidotes for uh, stress and depression. Because so much of stress, depression, and anxiety is about regretting something that happened in the past or being concerned about something that's in the future. It takes you, and life seems really heavy when you're trying to carry all the past and all the future into this sec, into this moment. But when all we have to do is be present to this moment and the, the challenges and the problems and uh, of the here and now, it becomes more accessible to deal with those problems. Very difficult to take on the world, everything else around us. So mindfulness, that's just one example of how mindfulness supports it, but mindfulness supports the well-being intention that often is a motivation for plant-based eating. I wanted to just interject here because my mind is one that tends to be a little bit more negative. I see suffering. I see all the things that are wrong. And what you're saying right now about mindfulness reminds me to appreciate these small things, these small privileges, even that I have, and it makes me so much more positive. So I'm now looking for reasons to be grateful. The food on my plate, the fact that veganism is so accessible where I live, the fact that my family has become supportive after years of not being so accommodating. And it just makes my negative lens turn a little bit more positive. Yeah, I think what you're speaking to a little is about seeing sort of a a little of the unfolding of things and how everything sort of combines together. As opposed to like when you're in the present, you're not thinking about the ideal for the future. You're available to that, to the meal you're having right now, to the choicefulness of what you're doing right now. And so part when one is really mindful, you're discerning, not, not discriminating. You're choiceful, not, not judgmental. And so what I'm hearing from you is that sort of you, you, you can choose how you respond and whereas you're less reactive which is what Bruce was talking about is being less reactive to people who have a different viewpoint or in some ways you feel attacked by. <laughs> Definitely. That, that's actually something that a lot of people who are listening to this podcast experience, they may have family members who are not supportive. And Bruce's way of dealing with that negativity is to meditate. And he said, you've been such a helpful resource to him. And are one of the reasons that he has in- encouraged all of his staff at good, the Good Food Institute to meditate using the Headspace app. So can you talk a little bit about how you have gotten to that place as an animal activist or as a vegan even? Well, I think part of how I've gotten into the place is just sort of a, a sense of longing for my own, my own happiness and well-being, just like I long for the happiness and well-being of others. And seeing like what works. I think we have a tendency to prioritize the urgent and not what's important. You know, mindfulness and meditation never feel urgent, but when you pay, but when you pay attention to your life, like what are the causes and conditions for your own well-being? I found for me that mindfulness is really supportive. And when I look at the people I love around me, 
what are the causes and conditions for their well-being? A lot of it has to do with how am I showing up in the world? And then when I'm happier and more content, they're more happy and more content. And this is actually very scientifically proven that we our, our attitude has ripples of those around us. And I'm sure you can look at anyone who's listening to this podcast can see examples of, of both the positive and the negative of that. When you're around family members or others uh, or friends that are, ha- that are angry or, or judgmental or have a negative attitude, it kind of rubs off on us. Is that, have you had that experience before, Michelle or uh, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and how about the opposite? Are there people that you're like, they can bring you out of a bad mood? Yeah. Yeah. And you can, I mean, it's kind of crazy because just exactly what you're saying, mindfulness is never urgent. And so, so many of us who live busy lives, crazy lives, which is all of us. <laughs> I mean, I definitely feel that way. Like I don't have time to sit down for even four minutes quietly. And you kind of need to be able to justify giving yourself that time. You need to be this, able to see the examples of people who are doing it, who their lives are changing. Because in the beginning, when you first start meditating or sitting in silence or whatever you're going to first try, it's hard and you don't really see the impact right away. So seeing the people who have implemented those practices, calming the mind and taking the time to really focus inward and meditate and then show up in the world differently, you really start to notice how that impacts their overall being (laughs) and presence in the world. And also you just see pretty much all of the great thought leaders in the world or game changers or movers and shakers, so many times when you look at their daily habits and practices, they've found meditation and that has impacted their ability to do good in the world and to just show up in a positive way. So yeah, it's really helpful to look at the people around you and how they behave and then see that you'll probably find a lot of them are being a lot more meditative in order to show up that way. Just bring and you can look at a different couple of different ways from a very productive standpoint, which is not the way I look at mindfulness, but if you one was to look at it that way, people that are happier are usually better at their jobs. People who are happier usually stay at their jobs longer. And so, so what, what they're doing. And so like, if you want to be better at your work, mindfulness is actually a really beautiful and indirect way to make you better at what you're doing. Athletes included as well. And so it's not linear. You can, tr- you can connect the dots in a way. Like if I, you know, if I do uh, spend another two hours, I can get two more sales if you're in sales, but it, it's in a way that you can, if you start paying attention, which mindfulness is all about paying attention, you can start seeing the connection between how I'm showing up and my, my attitude and my attention and focus and how that affects my capacity to do my work. And you start l- less focused on how many, the quantity of what you do, but the quality of what you do. And unless you're like a lawyer who sort of bills by the hour, generally you can get a lot more done with less time. So for people who are listening to this right now and are really interested in trying out being more mindful, what are some easy first beginner steps to take toward the path of mind- mindfulness? Well, how, how about this? Let's do a couple, uh, you know, we'll just try a little practice out here right now. So if Tony, you, Michelle, and anyone who's listening want to give this a shot, this is a, I, I'm a big believer that yeah, if I want to tell someone uh, what a peach tastes like, the best thing is not to describe, you know, its juiciness and its color and how it explodes in your mouth, but to actually give them a peach to bite into. So let's bite into the peach. That sounds great. Okay. So the invitation is here. This is, and this is a formal practice I'm going to offer you. Those, there's informal ways as, as well, but maybe the invitation is as long as you're not driving, to close your eyes. If you are driving, you still do every other part of what I'm inviting you to do, except for the closing your eyes. So closing your eyes. Just do a big exhale three times. Just a regular inhale and a large exhale. Maybe exhaling through the mouth. It relaxes the the nerve system when we do this. Or you can just check in with your body. What I mean by check in is just noticing where there's maybe tension. Noticing where there's, where your mind is stuck in another moment than now. Maybe you're 
thinking about what you have to do sometime this afternoon or something you forgot to do. Or you're anxiously waiting, when is this, is this part of the podcast going to be over? Or you're secretly hoping for this to take longer. Just noticing your mind state there. Maybe feeling, checking in and landing in this moment more fully after noticing what is taking you out of the moment. You can land by feeling the direct sensations of your body. You're feeling your feet, if you're sitting in a chair, feeling your feet on the ground. You can bring your attention further up from your feet to your lower part of your legs. Feeling your knees. And bringing the tension slowly up to your thighs, hamstrings. Into your seat, on the chair. And if any part of this body, your body scan is difficult for you to, to notice any sensation in your body, you can feel it. Just noticing the absence of sensation or the numbness of the body, which is really common. Sometimes we really spent so many years separate from being in our body and just being in our head, we lose our connection to their physical experience of life. And then feeling upwards to the lower spine in the back, middle of your spine, upper spine, and sides of the back as well. Your shoulders, noticing if they're tight, relaxed, if you feel asymmetric at all. The triceps of the upper arm and biceps and elbows, any sensation, maybe hot or cold, tingly, or numb. Maybe any pain in the body might be present. If there is, if you, if you lose your attention, just come back to the part of the body I'm referring to. Right now we're at the elbows. Moving down your attention to both forearms, to the wrist, to the hands, the clammy, dry, feel tight, loose. Even breathe into the hands. Palms and thumbs, fingers, the nails and the tips of the fingers. And you can even bring your attention now down to the, the belly. So refer to as the power center of the body. A place where you get to digest all this scrumptious plant-based food that Shell and Tony create in their menus and suggest and support our eating habits around. We'll play a place in the body that can tell us when we're in the body, did we eat something that was supported for our digestion? 
Does it feel heavy? Are we ate last or light? Do we eat too much? Am I hungry now? Just being aware. Or am I thirsty? Moving up the attention to the chest. Where our heart is. Physical heart. Some would say our spiritual heart. Place where you can easily connect the breath with the body. Noticing the expansion on the inhales. Maybe a relaxation on the exhale. The neck. Sometimes here we notice our posture. Carries this heavy 10 pound rolling ball above it. And the posture's off it. Sometimes cause discomfort in the short term or the longer term. Just having more attention here helps us to be more intentional about how we sit and stand. Just like our shoulders, are they forward, are they back? Their posture suggests a confidence. How does our attitude change depending on our posture? Coming up higher to the chin, and the lips, and the mouth, tongue, place we get to receive, as you said, Tony, to be grateful for the food we ingest. How remarkable it is. We have such access to a variety of foods. No time in history has that ever been available the way it is now. Mindfulness of bringing foods that not only please our palate, support our vitality, and speak to our heart's longing for connection and for meaning. Is there a dryness of the mouth or the lips? Is there saliva? Going to the space between the nose and the mouth. You can feel the air in and out of the nostrils as you inhale and exhale. Coming up further to the eyes. Years. Forehead and the back of the head. The top of the head. Feeling the entire body now. You can't feel it all at once. Maybe you feel an inhale the can Bring upwards a felt sense from the bottom of the feet up to the top of the head towards the end of the inhale. Maybe for a moment you can feel a sense of gratitude for this body, this vehicle we have to experience life. The only way I know we can experience life through touch, through smell, through seeing, through tasting, through hearing, and through cognition. These six senses, all we have for our life. Maybe setting an intention for the rest of your day before we return back to the podcast. Maybe how you can listen to the rest of this fully embodied. Ding. All right. There's a taste of what a formal practice of mindfulness might look like. That was awesome. Thank you, Ari. For people who are very, very new to meditating, what 
can they look for that is different in their minds and in their bodies with regular meditation? Well, I think the the most important thing is starting to see the habit patterns of the mind. And what what ends up happening is when you start watching your mind, you start noticing how crazy it is. And you start seeing how it thinks these crazy thoughts. And like, whereas if someone were to voice it, if it were, it were, if it would be like projected on a screen, all things your mind was thinking, you would call that person crazy. And that person's you. And, they, and you know what? You are not the exception. Everyone is thinking crazy thoughts. And I found that to be one of the greatest gifts of meditation because it's allowed me not to believe everything I think and to take less seriously each of my thoughts and feeling like my, I am my thoughts. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And so as that's something to pay attention to. And so you don't have to act in every one of your thoughts. You can just watch it arise and watch it pass away and not think that's, if you have a negative thought that you're a negative person, or if you have a negative thought about someone else that they're a bad person, just notice the thought itself. So I want to ask you a question on behalf of our listeners. Um, When you go plant-based, oftentimes it's because you have been exposed to some information or some things that have been challenging. It could be animal suffering in the food industry. It could be our health, our broken health system. It could be the environment, what we're doing to our planet in order to create our food. These are really heavy things to hold in our heads and our hearts, especially for those who have seen like graphic factory farming footage or anything like that. That sticks with you forever. And it's something you kind of have to process through in your brain, but that it just, it stays as a weight that you carry for the rest of your life. So I want to ask how meditation or mindfulness can both be helpful for kind of handling that and, and continuing to be a positive, radiant example and light and a happy human being, even though you've been exposed to so many difficult things in our world? Well, I think I can, I can answer it just more generally because every person is unique and where, where their, uh, their buttons are, right? I think we have a tendency in life to want to get rid of the button pushers as opposed to get rid of the buttons and realizing that if we can get, get rid of the buttons, then no one's going to be our button pusher. And that's a more successful and reliable way to feeling greater ease with this imperfect world we're in. And we tend to think that if only the world was like only the world was a vegan world, if only people were nice to animals, if only if only our food system was was healing and healthy, if only we had a regenerative approach to how humans showed up in the world, then everything would be fine. And and I think we more the more we make our happiness dependent on external circumstances, as I said before, the less likely we are going to fully experience the happiness we seek to have and the less empowered we are to co-create the world we want to see. So that is an answer to the question fully. So how do we do that is what I'm hearing you ask. And I think a lot of it is about self-awareness, because as we get to know ourself, we can see our tendencies of mind. We get to see what how we respond to circumstances and get to choose a different response so one starts watching one's own mind and own actions and they see that every time their partner makes a certain statement you know makes a comment about your food or your weight or something you did or did not do and we get feel triggered we can start seeing how that that triggering is causing us pain and and you start getting the making the connection between these attitudes of mind that cause us pain, you start wanting to like out of love for yourself, stop responding that way and choose being happy over being right sometimes. So the self-awareness it'll incline, can incline a responsiveness as opposed to reactivity. Reactivity is where we don't have a choice in what we do. It's just, it's automa- automated. It's like hitting your knee and your foot flying up. Responsiveness is, is about having options and choosing what option is the most skillful to respond. And when we can move in that direction of being responsive as opposed to reactive, we can be a better advocate for animals. We can be a better advocate for ourselves. We can be a better advocate for plant-based eating. And so things to bring that into your life can be very easy. One of the things that we, I do between, before each of my meetings is I take a minute just to breathe. I think, uh, I, before a meeting or a phone call or before I eat, just close my eyes and take, take a few breaths. And I feel calmer and more at ease. Um, you can sort of let go of the need to multitask. So when you're, when possible, you know, maybe sometimes if you're feeding your baby, you're just feeding your baby. You're just really present to the blessings of feeding your baby. 
When you're walking, you're walking as a form of mindfulness. When you're on the phone, you're fully present on the phone. You're not doing multiple things at the same time. That's one way of being mindful and to uh, increasing, uh, reducing our reactivity in this non-vegan world we live in. So there's a couple ideas. I would also just say that in anything we want to do ourselves, whether it's adopting a vegan diet or eating more plant-based or uh, bringing in mindfulness in our life, it's, a, it's surrounding yourself with people that want to do the same thing and are working towards the same things. Every, every time we add people around us to encourage us and support us, it becomes more the the natural response. It's said through science that we become the, the average, the mean of the five people we spend the most of time associating with. So really be judicious in who, we spend, who you spend time with and make requests of those people to do things together with you so you're not going alone. And so it becomes mutually supportive. Is that helpful, Michelle? Yeah, it is. And I think the support element is so important. I know mindfulness and meditation is something that both Tony and I have struggled with for a long time because we are such productivity obsessed human beings, but we both know how important it is. So it's the kind of thing that was on my dream morning routine for years without actually implementing much at all. And the first time that I started even for several days straight meditating was on a trip with Tony and she was using a mindful or a meditation app, Headspace maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Headspace. And so in the mornings together, we would sit and still ourselves before a crazy day ahead and we'd go through and listen to meditations together and having that partnership, it's kind of like going to the gym. Like I have a hard time dragging myself there and making, giving myself that time when life is so crazy and busy. But when you can find camaraderie in that and make it a way to connect with someone else at the same time, that for me has been really, really helpful in actually sticking with something like meditation. I'd also like to add that when we were meditating, because I know that 10 minutes or 15 minutes is not in our schedule right now or at that time, we tried to do two or three minutes and that even really, really made an impact or five minutes on a day we had more more of a morning, a free morning. And so even starting small and taking baby steps in the way we also encourage people to think of diet change is really wonderful in habit forming. I mean, it's, it's true for anything you want to do. If you want to start exercising, you want to hang out with people that are exercising, right? If you want to be better at being a salesperson, hang out with people who are really good salespeople. It's a very supportive habit to find other people who are doing what you want to do. All right, Ari. Well, thank you so much for coming onto our podcast and sharing all of your wisdom. I know that I am inspired again. It's really whenever I talk to you, I, I try really hard. At the, at the time I hung out with Michelle and she's mentioning this trip, I had just gone to one of your salons and was really inspired. And so I just think that you're a wonderful resource and source of inspiration. And I am feeling really good right now. I'm really grateful to be friends with you both and for the work you're doing in the world and how you show up. And your contagious enthusiasm speaks volumes for the virtue of the lifestyle you've chosen and makes it contagious for everyone around you in the best way. Thank you, Ari. Do you have any final words that you want to share for our listeners? Yeah, I would say when... It, if you are interested in practicing mindfulness and bringing it to your life, don't look for like the immediate results that your mind's going to be clear and blank. I've been practicing for 20 years and my mind still runs constantly, but I don't judge myself for my mind being the way it is. I have more ease with it and I take it a little more lightly, what I, like I said before, what I think. So, you know, take it on as a practice. Notice how you feel afterwards. Notice how you treat other people differently or you treat yourself differently. And if you want to know if your if meditation is working for you, see if it helps make you kinder. See if it helps you make you more joyful. See if it helps you make you more compassionate and more present to life. And, and then if that works, keep on trying it. Oh my gosh, I love that. What a beautiful way to evaluate success in mindfulness. Is there anywhere people can connect with you or resources that you'd like to share to help people along their own mindful journeys? Sure. One website well, where they're looking at is awaken.org, A-W-A-K-I-N. So awaken as in like kin as in like friends or family. There's meditation circles all around the world that are held in people's houses and they serve a vegetarian or vegan meal at those places, at those houses as part of it. Uh, and it's a great way to build community. So you find other people to meditate with, which as we talked about, supports the practice. 
There are many apps. I use something called Insight Timer. I know you mentioned the one that you use, Tony. There's something called Calm. There's, you know, um, 10% Happier. There's just many of them out there. Any one of those ones that will work. Try the one that works best for you. I always, I definitely encourage though trying to find friends to meditate with to build the pattern and habit around. And uh, and just don't don't let what you can't do get in the way of what you can or are willing to do. So as you said before, if you can't find 15 minutes, do one minute. You know, if you can't find the one minute, take three breaths. I have a teacher who suggests 10 times a day taking 10 breaths, mindful breaths. And I think, and if you can do that, I would be quite confident that your level of well-being will improve vastly. Those are great places to start. Thank you, Ari. And uh, we will include all of the resources that you have mentioned in our show notes. And we are so grateful again. Thank you, Ari. Oh, I'm add one more thing. All right, let's hear it. And if you're a person who's looking to do work in the world uh, as a, you know, a warrior of compassion and do it in a way that's grounded in the hearts, I am also on the board of an organization called The Pollination Project. And we give out grants of 500 to 5,000, usually for thousand dollars to people who are asking the question, what am I uniquely called to do in the world? How can I be of support? How can I use my, my, my thoughts, my cares, my concerns, my affinities, my talents, my community, my social network to make a difference in the world? We want to support you in it. So go to thepollinationproject.org to apply for a grant. Or if you want to support our work, feel free to make a donation. Thank you so much, Ari, for all of the work you do. And I encourage those listening whether you have a project that you want support bringing to life, or even if you don't and you're just looking for some inspiration, just browsing through some of the projects and individuals that you funded through the Pollination Project. Oh my goodness, like young children in other countries that are trying to change their communities or change the world. It's just such an inspiring place to look. So thank you for the, all the work you do with that. Yeah, I agree. I have been incredibly inspired, especially by the salons that you have hosted where you've brought in people who have whose work you have funded, children and women in other countries who are helping make water filtration systems out of peanut butter jars. I, I'm just so blown away by the amazing things that people are doing to be better people, to impact the world, to just spread good ideas for helping others. So thank you. We all have something to offer. Ari is such a kind and compassionate soul. And I feel like this episode really shows that. We are really grateful for the introduction to meditation and we hope that you explore it at a further time. For anyone listening, if you want to re-listen to the guided meditation that Ari took us through in this episode, we will have it for you over at the Plant Powered People Podcast website, which is plantpoweredpodcast.com. In the show notes for Ari's episode, you'll find that meditation. So if you are driving in the car or just not in a a state of mind where you're able to be fully present for that, we encourage you to go check that out there. And you can also find all of our other episodes and beyond at plantpoweredpodcast.com. And if you want to support our work, go over to patreon.com slash plantpoweredpeople. Thank you all so much for listening. We wish you a beautiful, mindful day and hope that you're able to integrate some of what you learned or inspiration that you picked up from this podcast episode into all your days going forward. It really, really will help in ways that you can't even imagine or fathom right now. So here's to all of us being more mindful and therefore more kind going forward. Thanks everyone. Have a beautiful day. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.